Hello, I'm Nito Cobain. Welcome to Side by Side. My guest today looked up to the Kansas skies as a child and marveled at airplanes. Years later, he'd be shot down from the skies over Hanoi, and he'd be held in a North Vietnamese prison camp for six years, 2,103 days. We're talking about faithful courage with an American hero, Captain Charlie Plum. Funding for Side by Side with Nito Cobain is made possible by... Here's to those that rise and shine, to friendly faces doing more than their part, and to those who still enjoy the little things. You make it feel like home. Ashley Home Store. This is home. The Bud Group is a company of everyday leaders making a difference by providing facility solutions through customized janitorial, landscape, and maintenance services. Coca-Cola Consolidated is honored to make and serve 300 brands and flavors locally. Thanks to our teammates. We are Coca-Cola Consolidated, your local bottler. Charlie, welcome to Side by Side. You're an American hero. You're a former fighter pilot. You're a captain of the U.S. Navy. Uh, you flew 74 successful combat missions in North Vietnam, over North Vietnam. You were shot down over Hanoi, and you came back to this country, and you got Silver Star, Bronze Star, two Purple Hearts. You have served your country well. And when you were in that prison in Hanoi for six long years, more than 2,100 days, you couldn't communicate with your colleagues, with your with your fellow comrades, except through the walls of that prison. How did you communicate? We found communication was vital just for our own existence. And not necessarily because of what we were passing around, the words, it was the validation of another human being in another cell. And so we tapped on the walls in a very cumbersome code where various numbers of letters, numbers of taps would be um, letters of the alphabet or abbreviations. And that was our language. We, we learned to know that language uh, just as well How as English. How was that your language? That was our language. It just sounded to me like a bunch of knocks on a, <laughs> on a, on a, on a table. It's a four by f uh, five by five matrix where each line uh, is numbered one through five and uh, the rows are numbered one through five. So A is one, one. Z is five, five. Uh, we left out K just to make it come out even. Who came up with that? You know, it's an old miner's code. When miners were trapped in mines and they could tap on a pipe, um, that's the way that they use that. And, and one of the POWs had learned that code and, uh, and brought it to the camp. And how long did it take any of you to learn it? It, it took probably a month to learn the code. And it sometimes was very difficult because in one of the prison cells I was in, I had a guy next door that I wanted to communicate with. And so I would tap one, two, three, all the way through 26. And then I would wait for an hour and start again. One, two, through 26. It took two weeks for him to realize that one would represent an A, 26 would represent a Z. And with that then, I explained to him the five by five matrix. and. Uh, it, it worked, but it took a long, long time. So let me give you some sentences and you uh, <laughs> tell me what they were. See how well you remember this matrix. Um, say, good morning. Wow, that took a long time. That's all we had. Was time. It was time. You were <laughs> stuck there. Time. Take us there, Charlie. I want to know how does a human being survive such a difficult time in his life? First of all, you were shot down, and were found by. I was captured immediately. As I was parachuting in enemy hands, they were shooting at me. I was dodging bullets in that parachute, and I thought. Uh, that's not really fair. They just shot down my airplane. <laughs> now they're trying to kill the pilot. <clears throat> but 
they were right there, this was just south of Hanoi, the capital city. And so they captured me immediately, hauled me into the prison camp, tortured for two days for propaganda and military information, and then tossed into this little eight foot by eight foot prison cell. They, speak, they spoke English? Uh, no, <laughs> they were just poking me and grunting and hollering and in their language. I see. They spoke no English. I see. And then what? I, uh, I, I paced that floor, three steps one way and three steps the they other. They put you in a cell? In a prison cell that was eight um, feet long and eight feet wide. And what was in the cell? Um, there were four bunks. I later, I, I, I later had three roommates in that eight foot, eight foot cell. So there were four beds where we slept, a bucket, a uh, two gallon bucket, which was our latrine, and no windows, uh, a flap in the door where the guards could come at any moment and open that flap and see what you were doing in your cell. Mm. Because we were supposed to be sitting there contemplating our sins against their country. Was there, was there light in the cell? Yes, now I was in several different cells while I was there. And most of them had a, a, a light bulb of some kind. But in one Did of the prisons- stay on 24 hours 24 a day? hours, mm-hmm. And there was also a speaker. Before they ever brought food or water, they would install a speaker in this cell. The speaker was so high on the wall, you couldn't adjust it or turn it off. And it just blared out the communist propaganda day and night. In English or? Yes, it was in English. Mm-hmm. And it, primarily a woman we called Hanoi Hannah. It was similar to Tokyo Rose in World War II. And she would come on in the morning, and, and, and early in the morning, and she would say, good morning, obdurate American air pirates. This is the voice of Vietnam. Well, we didn't know what obdurate meant. <laughs> and we thought she was trying to say pilots, but she was saying pirates because of the L difficult to pronounce in Asian mm-hmm. languages. And, and so uh, not too many years later, uh, a voice came on the radio, an English voice that we recognized. It was Jane Fonda. And, uh, and, and, and she said the same thing. Good morning, obdurate American air pirates. This is the voice of Vietnam. Wow. <laughs> and, and so it was, it was disappointing to know that she was just reading a script and they really were calling us pirates and not pilots. Mm-hmm. So um, you were there for six years. Uh, did you lose weight? Did you gain weight? Did you? We survived basically on two bowls of rice a day. So I was down to about 115 pounds most of the time that I was there. I weigh 170 now. So <clears throat> yes, we lost a lot of weight. Um, well, there was no medical care and I had four open wounds when I was shot down. And so uh, they eventually healed, but without on any- On their own, without any medical care. Without any medical care. It, it, was, it was kind of amazing because uh, guys had lacerations, guys would have impacted teeth, uh, things that we normally would just, you know, go to a, a hospital and have that fixed. Mm-hmm. And they all pretty much fixed themselves. How many Americans were in that? Uh, prison. I was in several different camps, and it, it ranged anywhere from 11 guys to 254. Really? And you never saw them? We never saw them. We would just, again, speak to them tapping on the wall. We wrote notes to each other on pieces of toilet paper and would um, slip the note under a door if we could, wrap it around a rock, heave it from one building to another. We call that airmail. <laughs> Probably the best code of all, and, and of course, as I say, it was vital. It was life and death vital that we communicate with the other prisoners. And, and maybe the best one was when we found that the, that the majority of them have tuberculosis, and they're always coughing and spitting, and they assume that we did too. So we found out that we couldn't whisper a word outside our cell, but we could go around coughing and spitting. You know, and we, we decided it's a natural. We'll make a code out of these silly guttural noises. You made another language out of coughing and spitting. We designated various letters of the alphabet or abbreviations to be represented by combinations of cough, sneezes, spits, or wheezes. So he'd wake up in the morning, hear the guys next door go, <laughs> that means good morning, how are you? <laughs> <laughs> well, that took short a time than yeah, well, all yeah, of this. Yeah. It was an abbreviation. Yeah. <laughs> wow. And, and you said it was, it was uh, imperative that you communicate with each other just for human survival, I take it. Truly, because in the prison cells, especially it was dark, as I say, some of them didn't have light and you couldn't tell green from red. 
uh, and you were alone in solitary confinement. Some guys were in solitary for four and a half years. Uh, I was not. I, they gave me a roommate eventually. But if it was dark and you were alone, you seemed to lose track of reality. Mm. And you don't know what's a real memory, what's a hallucination of a memory. And so it was just that the single tapping on a wall, and it, we, the call up was, and on the other end of the wall, the guy would go, uh, that meant two things. Number one, somebody's responding to something you're doing physically. Mm -hmm. Thus, I exist, I'm mm -hmm. real, I'm alive. Mm -hmm. And number two, somebody cares. Mm -hmm. And what, what was the objective? I mean, they put you in these cells. What was the outcome? What did they want to see the outcome? They wanted to reduce us to uh, the very baseline uh, person and then rebuild us as communists. Ho Chi Minh was their president, and that was, he publicly said, we're gonna take these Americans, we're gonna turn them into communists and send them back to America. Uh, and, and so that's what they tried to do. That's what the speaker was about, that's what the isolation was about, mm -hmm. that was what the lack of communication was about. It was brainwashing, about. basically. It was brainwashing. Yeah. Now they could do that to their own people, but they couldn't do that to us. Yes. It, a lot of it was just silly stuff that, that they came up with, and we laughed uh, frequently about their attempt mm -hmm. to brainwash us. Mm -hmm. But the real key to the survival was the leadership that we had in that prison camp. Guys like <clears throat> Jim Stockdale, Jeremiah Denton, John McCain, my old flight instructor, uh, these were the people that reset the goals for us. How did, I don't understand, leadership in the camp while you're prisoners. They couldn't see us, they couldn't fire us or hire us or give us a bonus or promote us. Um, th 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 and the only way they could even talk to us was tapping on the wall. Mm -hmm. a and yet it was the best leadership I have ever seen. They, they redefined our total mission. Hmm. When I was first shot down, I felt really guilty that I had surrendered. Fighter pilots are not supposed to surrender. That's not in our training. That's not in our DNA. Mm. And I flew the skies of North Vietnam thinking that I was tough enough that I would never ever give in to the enemy, as we all did. And yet we found that the torture was just too painful. And, and, and so we had, we had to give more than name, rank, serial number, date of birth, as the code of conduct states. Uh, and, and, and I felt uh, guilty, uh, you know, I've, how can I ever go back to my home country? How can I ever face my fellow fighter pilots and uh, admit that I had failed in my mission so miserably? So here comes Jim Stockdale and, and tapping on the wall, he said, we're not on the defensive here. We are on the offensive. We are warriors. We will pursue this war till our last dying breath. I couldn't believe it. I'm, I'm a Lieutenant Junior grade, okay? I'm, I'm wet behind, I'm 24 years old, okay? I'm wet behind the ears. And to, to have a senior officer tell me <laughs> that I'm on the offensive and I'm looking around in that prison cell, mm. uh, but it worked. What did it do? Did it give you hope? Did it give you? It gave, well, first of all, it gave us a mission, all right? Mm. It, it gave us a purpose in life. And it, it, it coalesced the prisoners of war into one unit. And it worked, it really worked. A study was done five years ago of all the combatants of Vietnam. 30.6% have post-traumatic stress disorder. Mm. Of the prisoners of war, 4% of us have PTSD. Wow, and you and attribute that to the leadership and to... Leadership and the unity of the team. Yeah. And I think it's true in, in business and mm -hmm. schools and life and families. If you, have a, if you have a defined purpose, our purpose was three words, really simple purpose. The purpose was return with honor. That's what we were to do. And Stockdale would say, every decision you make has to fit through that funnel, return with honor. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and so that became our mission. So Charlie, tell me this, if you were in cell number four and somebody else was in cell number 11, how do you communicate? How does four and 11 communicate? You, you, pass, you pass the word. You know, here's a message for cell number 11. I see. 
and it just keeps going from one to one. Yeah. There was a lot of knocking going There's on in the walls. A lot of knocking going on in the walls. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, it's the old game of password when you, you, you a circle and you pass something mm -hmm. to somebody and by the time it comes back to you, it's totally different. Well, that happened. And how did you well. pass your time? You, you played cards, you played, what did you do? Well, I, first of all, in solitary confinement, I went back through my mind and tried to remember every book I'd ever read, every movie I'd ever seen, every girl I'd ever dated. Um, and it took me about three months. I was 24 at the time. So in three months, I had pretty much exhausted. And I'd worked 10, 12 hours a day on this, just on this trying to, it's amazing the stuff that's in the back of your mind mm -hmm. that you never pull out because you never have the opportunity of being alone mm. <laughs> for six years. Mm -hmm. um, and then when I got through that, I planned my future. And uh, the next 20 years of my life around my high school sweetheart, whom I had married after I graduated from the Naval Academy. Mm -hmm. And I planned 20 years around her and I still wasn't home. So I went back through the 20 years and planned it in a different method, you know, a little more aggressive or a little less aggressive. And, 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 so, I, and so when I finally came home, I had three different options, you know, <laughs> of ways that I could re live my life. Mm -hmm. Of course, they all sort of fell through because she filed for divorce just three months before I came home. Wow. And so uh, I couldn't use any of those three plans. But by that time, you know, I'd figured out pretty much the answer to adversity. You know, I, I figured out, hey, if I look hard enough at this puzzle of challenge, I will find an opportunity within this. Mm. And so I started to tell my story and, uh, mm. and, and, and it, the, it seemed to fit. I mean, mm -hmm. people really respond to someone who's been um, frustrated and, and alone and uh, unable to communicate with those they love. And, and afraid. And afraid, absolutely. And feeling in the mission, you know, it was interesting that I felt at, at the time that I was the only one who had failed. And yet, when I started to communicate with the other prisoners, I found everybody felt guilty that they had surrendered to the enemy. Mm. And, and, and in fact, some of the guys even, even considered suicide because they had failed mm. so miserably and they didn't want anybody to ever know how, how weak they were. Mm -hmm. uh, and so uh, pretty much a lesson of life, you know, take your failures and, and, uh, and, and use the failures in the future. Mm -hmm. And then you came home. I did. And um, you had parachuted out of the airplane. I did. <clears throat> uh, what happened when you came home? Several things when I came home. Uh, you know, I began to travel and, and have a, a beautiful life. And <laughs> the doctors and psychiatrists said we'd be in baskets. They had our families briefed to institutionalize us the rest of our lives. Really? Yes. Uh, 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 I mean, what can you expect, you know, that long under those conditions? Mm -hmm. but, but, but I, you know, I just grabbed life and went on with it. And several years after I came home, I was in a restaurant in Kansas City where I lived at the mm -hmm. time. And at about two tables over, a guy kept looking at me and I caught his eye. He walked over to my table, pointed at me and he said, you're Captain Plum. I said, yes, sir. I, he said, you flew jet fighters in Vietnam, part of that Top Gun outfit. You were shot down, parachuted in enemy, enemy hands. You spent six years as a prisoner of war. I said, how in the world did you know that? He said, because I'm the guy that packed your parachute. Wow. <laughs> I'm the guy who packed your parachute. <laughs> I, was, I was aghast. I could barely stagger to my feet, reach out a very grateful hand of thanks. I was speechless. He came up with the proper words. He grabbed my hand, he pumped my arm, and he said, I guess it worked. <laughs> wow. I said, Have you seen the guy since? Yes. As a matter of fact, <clears throat> we became really good friends. But you know, that night, I didn't get much sleep. I wondered how many times I might have passed him in the passageway of that ship and never said a word to him. He was a sailor. I was a fighter pilot. Okay. How many times I might have passed him on a liberty call and, 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 and never said thank you. Mm. And then suddenly he's the guy who saved my life. And again, a lesson in life, you know, who packs your parachute? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, who is it that gives you those nuggets that you're going to need when the going is tough? Who provides you with the resources to right. achieve your goals? Well, Charlie, you've been traveling around the country and inspiring tons of audiences. Uh, you've spoken to business audiences and to nonprofit organizations and to governmental organizations and to students and others. What are the two or three things that you tell them that you have 
uh, deducted or deduced from your own life that they can apply in their own life? I think the first principle is you have a choice. It's very simple, but people miss when they're surrounded by adversity, you know, when, when, when everything is on top of them, they think, I, I, I'm a victim of circumstances beyond my control. I cannot control this. You can't control what's around you, but you can certainly control the response. Your Don't response. give up. Don't, Don't give, give up. up. Yeah. You know, keep on keeping on. The other thing is, if you look close enough, you can find an advantage in every challenge you ever have. Mm. There's, a, there, there's a seed of value in there. Now, and, and I try to make it a puzzle, okay? If it is true that there is an opportunity within this problem, the puzzle is go find it and, and work as hard as you can to find that peace. Mm -hmm. um, a Bible verse came to me in a prison camp. All things work together for good to, to, for those that love the Lord. And I'm thinking to myself, how can this work together for good? I'm in misery and pain. I'm bleeding from four open wounds, you know? How, how can this, and all I have to do is love the Lord, you know? And it's the same thing in life, whether you're a Christian or not. You know, if, there's, if, 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 if something good can happen in this situation, go find it. Mm. It's, mm. Uh, there's a germ of good in all that we do, I truly all that happens to us. If you were speaking to um, young people today who are starting their life, uh, you would give them what piece of advice? First of all, I, I, I would say find your support group, okay? Uh, find the people who you trust. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, mean, I mean, trust is just vital as you grow up. And I think when you lose trust in people, it, it, it's forever to try to regain that trust. Mm -hmm. So be trustworthy and look for trusty people, trustworthy mm -hmm. people. Yes. So Charlie, when you came back from Vietnam, we all know a bit of history about how Vietnamese um, soldiers were not treated with the greatest of respect. I don't like bringing that up, but I want your take on it. Surely. To begin with, it's true that particularly as the war had, had gone on for five, six, seven, eight years, and there was an anti-war element in the states that were very unhappy with this. And so when they only knew to pick on the soldiers that were, were, uh, were over there fighting, uh, and we were over there just trying to do our job. Mm -hmm. Now, the You were end, following orders. We were following orders. And, you know, and we were patriotic and we, we, were, we were proud to, to fight for the flag, you know, for our way of life. We really felt that was vital. And so we were, you know, we were really into that. And then to come back and find people spitting on the soldiers and that kind of thing, it, 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 was, it was depressing. Mm. But when I came home, it was sort of the closing of the chapter of Vietnam. And so I didn't, I didn't experience that. I see. Um, in fact, they had ticker tape parades and gifts from all over the country. Um, <laughs> was it because you were a prisoner of war? Well, yes, but also because it was sort of the, it was the finality. You know, it was the, let's, you know, let's find something that's good about this war. Mm -hmm. The good part is we got our prisoners back. Mm -hmm. President Nixon, of course, was, uh, w w was a big part of that. And we had, a, we had a, a great dinner, the biggest dinner the White House has ever served to this day, as a matter of fact, was when the POWs came back. Uh, and, and he invited us to, to bring our first ladies because many of us had come back to divorces. And so I mm. took my mother to the White House. Really? You took my, your mom? I took my mom. Yeah, your wife had filed for divorce three mm -hmm. months prior. Right. And, uh, and it, was, it was a wonderful, wonderful homecoming for us. It was really bright and shiny. Um, Ford gave us a brand new car. Lazy Boy gave us a, a, a recliner. <laughs> it was a wonderful the way they came out of the woodwork. Uh, to, uh, to, 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 and it, we, when we found out that so many of our compatriots, other guys had been over there and come back to, uh, to, to a, a, an ungrateful nation, you know, we went to the hospitals uh, and, and we talked to these guys mm -hmm. because we felt like that we were getting the accolades that really should have gone to them. Mm -hmm. 
and uh, you know a lot of them, of course, POWs. Are you still in touch with them? Do you get together? Is there such a thing as a, an annual conference? There's an annual reunion of the POWs. We get together, talk about the good old days. <laughs> where, where, where is this conference? Well, it's in various parts of the country. I see. Yeah, uh, this year it was in Colorado Springs. Yes. And next year, I think it's going to be in uh, Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but there are 591 of us came home. And we'll have a conference for probably 300 to 350 of those guys. Uh, we're, we, we're, we're like brothers. When somebody saves your life, um, it's, a very, it's a very close uh, association, probably the closest that you can get. Mm -hmm. when, and and a, a lot of the guys saved my life and they claim that I saved theirs. And so it's a, you know, it's a very cohesive group. Yes, it's a bind that brings you all together. Well, you're an amazing guy, Charlie Plum, Captain Charlie Plum, winner of Bronze Star, Two Purple Hearts, Silver Star. You've earned your wings uh, figuratively and literally. And we're proud of you, and we're very grateful for your service to our country. And I'm delighted that you shared this platform with me today. I'm a better person because I know you. Well, thank you. Funding for Side by Side with Nito Cobain is made possible by Here's to those that rise and shine, to friendly faces doing more than their part, and to those who still enjoy the little things. You make it feel like home. Ashley Home Store. This is home. The Bud Group is a company of everyday leaders making a difference by providing facility solutions through customized janitorial, landscape, and maintenance services. Coca-Cola Consolidated is honored to make and serve 300 brands and flavors locally. Thanks to our teammates. We are Coca-Cola Consolidated, your local bottler.